Good morning. Love that song. Thank you, team. Thank you, Mike. And uh, that might be one of my favorite worship teams. Man, it's been an exciting week, hasn't it? Like just watching the news and watching everything that's going on and a lot has happened since we last met and people's emotions are all over the place. I don't know if you guys are on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or, you know, if you've had a family reunion in the last week or you've just been around in the workplace, just listen to people's conversations. Um, like people are all over the place. Some people are absolutely delighted and others are absolutely terrified. Some are just ready to quit. They're just ready to leave the United States of America and go live in a hole. And others are just getting started. Like, I mean, we're just all over the place. And um, I think it's kind of convenient that we're starting this new teaching series today um, because, in my opinion, these are incredibly exciting days. These are not days to be scared of. In my opinion, as a follower of Jesus, these are absolutely exciting days. Like, this is what we train for. This is the time. And we, this, is, this is the day in which Christians, followers of Jesus, have an opportunity to shine bright in a world that's filled with craziness. I think that these days provide us actually with two different opportunities. One, to tighten up our focus on Jesus. Because I think for too long, there have been people in the church, unfortunately, that have looked to, to government, they've looked to, uh, they've looked to religious institutions, they've looked to educational institutions. I think for too long, there have been people who've looked outside of and other places than Jesus for hope and for leadership and for help. I think in these days, it's an incredible opportunity for every single one of us to tighten up our focus on Jesus. And then I would say, I think these days also give us the opportunity as Christians to demonstrate the distinctive of love. Because Jesus said, look, there's one thing that's going to separate you from everyone else in the world. And that's the way you love. That is the way you love. And I think if you listen to the voices of our, in our culture, that, that and, and on all matters of things, whether it be gay marriage or, or racial violence, whatever, and you can pick your topic. You can pick politics if you're red or you're blue. You can pick um, just any number if you're for the Common Core curriculum or you're against Common Core curriculum. There's so much angst in our culture. And I think the one thing that Jesus said to us that will set us apart from everyone else in the world is love. I think this is a perfect opportunity for us as followers of Jesus to demonstrate the distinctive of love in our culture. So last week, the, there's a, a, a news release by the U.S. News and World Report. They published an article by a guy named Ken Walsh, and it was entitled this, Americans have lost confidence in everything. And he wrote this article after he had surveyed a recent Gallup poll in which they, they did an extensive survey of Americans on all number of different things. And um, he, he said, and he wrote this article, and we'll probably, if we'll link to it today on our Facebook page, church180. Uh, my, or facebook.com slash mychurch180. But I think the most important line in this article is the one that he wrote after reviewing all this data. This is what he said. All in all, it's a picture of a nation discouraged about its present, worried about its future, and highly doubtful that its institutions can pull America out of its trough. Now, my guess is, if, if you have talked or listened much at all in the last week, months, even the last few years, that it's not uncommon at all to have a feeling or hear despair in people's voices. Like, it's not at all uncommon to hear a sense of uh, almost lostness and bewilderment about what the future will hold. And in my opinion, like, what he says right here, it's a picture of a nation discouraged about its presence, worried about its future, highly doubtful that its institutions can pull America out of its trough. That sentence gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And I'm hopeful for this reason, because people are losing faith in the institutions to which they've looked for so long for help. People are losing faith in government. People are losing faith in business. People are losing faith even in religious institutions. And if there's ever been a time for religious followers, for, for followers of Jesus, for Christians, to live well, to love generously, and to offer hope, it's today. Like, we have this incredible opportunity in front of us. So I'm actually not discouraged one tiny bit about anything that's happening, or, or it will happen. In fact, I, I actually think that we may be entering an era, if you study the course of history, I think we may actually be entering an era where the church has an incredible opportunity and, and, and it, with that opportunity, a responsibility to redefine ourselves 
and be the institution that God created us to be. See, God created us. The Bible says that we are the body of Christ. In other words, if Jesus were here in a physical form, what would he do? The answer to that question should be why he would do what the church is doing. I think the era in which we live is an incredible opportunity for us as believers to show the world what our leaders like, Jesus. So, I would just say that in all of everything that's going on, I don't know where you stand on any of the rulings that have been done this week, and not just this week, quite frankly, but over the last months and over the last decade. All this stuff, there's just craziness, right? I would say that it's not a time for despair, but it's a time for aggressive love and focused action. But I think before we actually get on and and start that, I think there's a few things that we have to understand about what it means to be a Christian, about how to connect to God, and how to live well in a world that's losing hope. Because our world is losing hope. Gallup says it. But you don't even have to look to Gallup. You can just listen to other people talk, and you realize there's a lot of downhearted people. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to read from, and we're going to learn from, a letter in our Bible that's called the Book of Galatians. And um, this letter was actually written by a man named Paul. And we're going to learn about his story. But in a nutshell, uh, Paul was an Ill- a religious extremist. And this is what he did. He helped capture people and eliminate people who didn't believe like he believed. He was, in every sense of the word, Paul was a religious extremist. And then, and then one day, Paul had this vision. Jesus appeared to him. And according to him, he knocked him right on down. And he told him a few things. And then after he, he shared, Jesus shared this stuff with Paul, he told Paul, he said, I want to use you to start a bunch of new churches and to tell people about me. After he recovered from this experience, Paul went on to do just exactly what Jesus had called him to do. He told the world about Jesus. He started a bunch of new churches. He wrote a, a bunch of letters to those churches, which ultimately ended up in this book, which we now call our Bible. And one of those churches he started was in a city of Galatia, which is in modern day Turkey now. After Paul started this church, he moved on, which is what he would do. He would go to thriving cities, he would start a church, and then he would move on, he he would appoint leaders, he would get them set up, and then he would move on to another city and start up another church, appoint leaders, get them set up, move on to another city. That's how he that's how he worked. And um, he would often then write letters to those churches that he had started. And in these letters, he would do things like um, answer questions that they were asking. He would give guidance to them, or he would address problems that they were working through. In fact, in our New Testament, there's 27 books. There's books or letters, all right? Um, and 13 of them are written by this guy named Paul. Nine of them are actually letters to churches that he had started or was familiar with, and the other four are letters to local church leaders. So it's kind of interesting when you read through the New Testament, you get a sense of this, this guy, Paul, he was a prime figure in the early church. Like, he was a mover and shaker. He was a man that God used significantly. And when he first started out, he was a man that hated God and hated the ways of Jesus. In fact, he, again, he captured and eliminated people who believed in Jesus, but Jesus grabbed the hold of his life, completely turned him around and changed him. And so now we have Paul uh, to thank for much of what is written in here. So Paul wrote this letter to the early church in Galatia, and it starts like this. This is what he said. This letter is from Paul, an apostle. I was not appointed by any group or human authority. My call is from Jesus Christ himself and from God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, there's a couple things in here that I want to call your attention to. I personally believe what, this, what these words say. I believe there was a man named Paul. And if you do research historically, that's, that's not a hard thing to document. There was a man named Paul who traveled around the, 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 uh, the Middle East starting churches. That's, that's easy to document historically. And he says he was appointed by the leader of the church, Jesus. And, and there was no arm wringing. There was no political move, maneuvering. There was no nepotism. Uh, Paul was chosen. He said, look, I wasn't appointed by any group or by human authority. The leader of the church, Jesus, called me to do this. And, and I, I would just say this to you. Um, I still think this happens. I still think that Jesus calls people to do work for him in the area of ministry, to start churches, to be pastors in churches. I believe God uses us all in, in whatever venue we find ourselves serving to do ministry for him, to represent him well. You know, whether we're driving a truck or teaching in a classroom or a stay-at-home mom, or, or whatever you may do. You, you may wear a white collar, you may wear a blue collar, you may not wear a collar, right? But I believe Jesus uses each one of us to represent him in this world. But I do think that from time to time, God calls people to serve him in a separate vocation, the vocation of ministry. And maybe some of you in this room, God has been knocking on your heart and saying, I want you to consider giving your life to ministry in some form. Maybe it's a missionary, maybe it's a pastor, 
You know, maybe it's an author, maybe it's an evangelist, whatever the case may be. I still believe that Jesus does that. That's been my personal experience. And when I was about 20 years old, God knocked on my heart and said, I want you to give your life to ministry. And, and hence, I ended up being a pastor. And um, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. I, I absolutely, this is what God made me to do. And maybe that's your case too. Um, so I, I would just say when, when Paul says this stuff, I, I like that. I, I agree that there's probably, all of this is true. There's a man named Paul who was called by God to do this work of ministry. The other thing in this first sentence that, uh, that is worthy of note is when Paul says, uh, my call is from Jesus himself and from God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Now, uh, we say this every Easter, but it probably needs to be said more. If you could disprove the resurrection of Jesus, then the entire Christian faith is dismantled. All you have to do to destroy the Christian faith is somehow demonstrate that Jesus did not raise from the dead. And the entire Christian faith is dismantled. And honestly, if there were a point at which someone could clearly demonstrate that Jesus had not been raised from the dead, I would immediately resign my position as a pastor. I would denounce my Christian faith because it would have been built on a lie. But, but the good news is, is that in spite, of, in spite of centuries of attempts, no one has ever been able to clearly demonstrate that the resurrection has not in fact happened. And so we continue to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. He's alive. He empowers those who believe in him to live new lives. That is the essence of the Christian faith. I would just say this, the resurrection is the indispensable linchpin of our faith. And if it's not true, then neither really is any other part of the Bible. Because the entire Bible is built around this core truth. Jesus died for our sins and was raised by God to life and will someday come for us. The whole Bible is built around that teaching, that core idea. Now, Paul continues to write. He's writing to the Galatians and he says, look, I'm writing to you. I'm Paul. I'm rep- I was called by God to go and to plant churches and then he says, I have a group of people here in this city that I'm at now, and we're, we're all sending our, our, our love to you, and we, we send grace to you and peace to you. We wish you the best. And then he says this, Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father planned, in order, read this last line with me, please, to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. Jesus gave his life for our sins. This is the essence of Christianity. I mean, if you say, what, is it to, what does it mean to be a Christian? This is the essence of it. His life, our sins. See, we believe, we, and we talked about this a few weeks ago, we believe that we have a God that is perfect. And he is going to someday settle the score on everything. Every wrong that has ever been done, he's going to address. He's going to punish everything that's been left undone. Every sin that's ever been done, every wrong, every wrong that's been done, he's going to completely and thoroughly address. And that includes ours. Every, every lie that we've told, every sin that we've committed, every time we've stole, every time we've cheated, every act of immorality, God said, look, this stuff can't happen in my, in my world. This can't happen. And I'm going to punish every time that it does happen. It may not happen. I may not punish it now, but someday I'm going to punish it. And then Jesus stepped up and says, well, I'll take their punishment. Our sins, his life. I mean, really, it comes down to this. He stepped in as our substitute. He took our place. The punishment that God has against our sins landed squarely on his back. And when we believe this, we're forgiven by God. His spirit moves inside of us and he empowers us to live new lives, to have new attitudes. What used to be a heart filled with hate can now be a heart filled with love. What used to be a heart that's filled with anger can now be a heart that's filled with kindness. God transforms us. He makes us more and more and more like Jesus. And the longer we live and follow Jesus, the more like Jesus we become. And that's, we're going to be talking about that a little bit more over the next few weeks. But, but there's this line I really want to focus on, especially in light of everything that's going on today. Jesus gave his life for our sins in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. So I, when he says we live in an evil world, I, I mean, I, I believe that, right? And, and I don't think that it's a hard case to make. Like, if you don't believe that we live in an evil world, just turn on the news for 24 hours. I mean, there's racial violence, there's judicial injustice, there's sexual abuse, there's dishonesty, there's extortion, there's cheating, there's lying, there's scandals all over the place. Like, there's a lot of craziness in our world. And I, I could go on and on, and we could illustrate this for the rest of our time together this morning. We live in a crazy world. Now, I want to speak specifically this morning to Christians. 
And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I want to say I'm glad that you're here. Um, We actually built this for you. And I hope and I pray that you feel loved and that you feel accepted and, and that you feel wanted in this environment. That is my prayer. That is our prayer for you. If you are not a Christian, we hope that you feel the love of God through us. And I even hope that you might begin to dance with the idea that there's a God and he loves you. In fact, there's this God that even likes you and would like to be in a relationship with you. That is our prayer. That is our hope. That is why Church One Eight exists. But what I want to say this morning is I, I need to talk to the home team. And, and you're welcome. If you're, not a, if you're not a believer, you're welcome to, to lean in and listen up, and maybe it'll be insightful for you as well. So this is to Christians. If you're in this room and you call yourself a Christian, I have a couple of questions. Why are we so surprised when an evil world acts evil? Why are we so surprised when a crazy world acts crazy? Why are we surprised when people who don't believe in our God don't do the things he says? Why are we surprised when people who don't believe in our God disregard his instructions? I mean, it would like be, why are we surprised when a two-year-old doesn't act like a 30-year-old? See, as I ponder everything that's happening in our culture, and I'm not speaking exclusively of, what, of, of the ruling on Friday, I'm just speaking of things in general. I think sometimes we expect people who don't believe in our God to act like they do. So let me illustrate it like this. You've heard of Sharia law, right? Um, there is a conversation about Sharia law going on in our country right now. If you're not familiar with Sharia law, it's a, it's a legal framework that uh, many Muslim countries, millions and millions and millions of Muslims embrace. It's, it's a religious and a legal framework that tells people how they should live their lives both publicly and privately. It's under Sharia law that women have to be fully veiled. It's under Sharia law that women can't vote. It's under Sharia law. I mean, all of these, all this crazy stuff under Sharia law. In fact, I mean, it, it, it's, there are advocates of of Sharia law in our country trying to get it implemented into our court systems. In fact, it was just two years ago that North Carolina passed a law in which they said to all the judges in North Carolina, you cannot use Sharia law to determine whether it's right and wrong in North Carolina. Okay, so, I mean, there are people who are pushing to have Sharia law as a, as a, set, of, as a set of rules and a set of laws in our country. Lots of Muslims around the world, pushing for Sharia law to be the law by which we live. It's the law of Allah, right? Allah, the the Muslim God. They they want us to live according to his rules, according to the rules taught in the Quran and other holy writings. Now, when I hear about Sharia law, I'm like, I'm not following that. I have no desire to follow that. I don't believe in Allah. He's not my God. And in fact, if you insist that I follow Sharia law, I'm going to strongly oppose that. I'm going to, I'm going to fight against that. I do not want to follow anything that a law says because he's not my God. I don't believe in him. You get where I'm going on this? I have a lot of friends, and you probably do too, who do not believe in our God. Now, if I'm not willing to live by Sharia law, which is the law of a law, Muslim law, Because I don't believe in him, how can I then expect my friends who don't believe in my God to follow his rules? Does this make sense? Speaking to the home team. I think sometimes we create a lot of problems for ourselves when we expect people who don't believe in our God to live according to his rules. We end up criticizing them for doing something that we ourselves aren't willing to do, and that is follow the rules of a God we don't believe in. Now, to be clear, I believe there is one God. I believe God created the world. I believe God gave us the capacity to make choices. God gave us free will. I believe that under the influence of the evil one, we made bad choices. And consequently, we live in an evil world. However, I believe that that our God sent a Savior, Jesus, to save us from the chaos of our sin and bad choices. 
and we experience salvation when we believe in him. That's what I believe. I believe that based on this book and my experience. Not everyone believes that, though. And I would simply say to all of my Christian friends, stop expecting your friends who do not believe in your God to live by his rules. Stop being surprised when the world does things that do not align with the teachings of our God. Because that's what the world does. What did Paul say? He said, we live in an evil world. We live in a crazy world. We live in a world that's filled with chaos. We should expect that. Jesus, in one of his prayers, was talking to his father. And look what he said. He said, righteous father, the world doesn't know you. The world doesn't know God. We're surrounded by people. We, we live next to people. We may live with people. We work with people. We shop with people. We go to school with people who don't know our God. And therefore, they're not going to live according to his rules. So we shouldn't be surprised when they don't. Now, we believe that Jesus came into this world. He died for our sins. He was raised again to rescue us from this world. And this is what Christianity is all about. Discovering God, discovering a new way to live, a way that is constructive and not destructive, a way of hope and not disappointment. It's a way of love and not harsh criticism. It's a way of grace and kindness, not selfish narcissism. Now, I love this. Paul said, look, Jesus came into this world to rescue us from this world, to to bring us in and to teach us a new way to think, to teach us a new way to live, to teach us new things. That's why Jesus came, to save us. But then I love what Jesus said. Once he was praying for all the people that would follow him, both those people that were following him and the people that would follow him, which would include us. And this is what he said in John chapter 17. He said, God, as you, Father God, as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world. In other words, Jesus said, look, I'm going to rescue my people from the world, and then I'm going to send them into the world. I'm going to send them into the world to show the world what I'm like. Because I, I, this is essentially what being a Christian is, to be rescued from the world, to be taught by our leader Jesus what it is to think new thoughts, what it is to live a life of love, what it is to demonstrate grace, what it is to demonstrate kindness, what it is to be a servant in this world. Jesus teaches us these things and sends us out into the world to love those who don't think like us, to love those people who don't understand or know our God, to show those people what our God is like by the way that we live. Now, what we have to do is live like Christians, surrounded by people who don't understand us, who may not believe in our God, who think differently, who act differently than us. This is our job. And in another one of his letters, St. Paul told us how we go about this. This is what he said. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Stop for just a second. See, a lot of times what happens is is as Christians, we allow the world, that entity that doesn't know God, that doesn't know how God thinks, that, that doesn't even really believe in God, we allow the world to shape our ideas. We allow the world to shape our work ethic. We allow the world to shape us by the music that we listen to, by the TV that we listen to. When I was a kid, I went to church, and when the preacher would start preaching on stuff like this, everybody would say things like, uh, well, he's meddling now. Remember that? Any of you guys ever hear that? He's meddling now. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Maybe meddling a little bit. But honestly, like, think about it. Like, the, the music that we listen to, the television that we watch, the things that we, the books that we read, the things that we fill our mind in, a lot of this stuff is shaped by the thinking of the world. And Paul says, look, if you're a Christian, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person, changing the way that you think. And, and let me just tell you this. The quickest way to make that happen The quickest way to allow God to change the way you think is to spend time reading and studying what God wants. You can find that right here in the Bible. And I would encourage you also to to do your own learning. Don't always rely on the preacher. Look, I do my very best. I study, I prepare, I take it seriously, the responsibility that God has given me to, to teach His Word to this church. I take that very seriously. But listen, don't just rely on me. Do your own work. Don't just rely on the songs that you hear on the radio. 
you know, they maybe they're Christian songs, but don't just rely on those. Actually go to God and let God shape your, let this and let me or other preachers and songs be supplements to your learning what God wants. And when you do all of this, when you allow God to begin to shape and change the way that you think, Paul says this, then you will know what God wants you to do and you will know how good and pleasing and perfect his will really is. When we fully know God, when we begin to enjoy him and appreciate him and understand him, and then we go out into the world that doesn't know God, that doesn't appreciate God, that doesn't respect God, and we begin to live our lives filled with love and kindness and grace and courage and wisdom, and we begin to show the world what God is like, imagine what could happen. I've been watching Facebook this week. My heart hurts because of all the anger and the meanness that I've seen coming from both sides. But I expect more from believers. I've seen believers saying a lot of really harsh, critical things, and I wonder if Jesus has winced. I wonder. Because at the end of the day, we're known for our love, for our grace, for our kindness. So let me ask you a few questions. What would happen in our world if Christians would stop being shocked at how the world lives? A crazy world is going to live crazy. What would happen if Christians would begin to learn how God wants us to live and then live that way? What would happen if Christians would stop judging the world and start loving the people of the world? Now, some people may say, um, I don't agree with that statement. Well, let me show you 1 Corinthians. This is Paul again, 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. He says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. God will judge those on the outside. It's not my job to judge people who don't know God. It's not my job to pass judgment on people who don't believe in my God. And it's not your job either. It's not our job to judge the world. You know what it is our job to do? To love the world. And I would simply ask this last question. What would happen if churches stopped saying you can't come in here and started saying we've been waiting for you? So let's talk about particularly the issue of, of gay marriage. It's a big deal. So let's talk about it. Over the last two years, I've spent a lot of time reading and thinking about this. I've spent a lot of time talking with gay men and women. And what I've realized is that the church has almost consistently said, particularly to this group of people, gay men and women, you can't come in here. You can't find God in here. And so we've basically stiff-armed them and made them go off in search of God on their own. And I just want to say at Church 180, we are designed to be a church for anyone and for everyone. And everything we say and everything we do is designed with an eye towards men and women who do not believe in our God. And I know not everyone will be comfortable with that, but here's what I want you to know. There's not one perfect person in this room. If we were to pull back the blankets on your life, would you be okay with that? If we were to open the closet on my life, would I be okay with that? I mean, the point is this, we all have junk. We all have stuff we're working through. And I just want to go on record as saying, no matter who walks through that door, no matter who they walk through the door with, my prayer is, and my intention is, that they will know the love of God as demonstrated through His church. Amen? Now, that happens with you. I mean, I, when I see new people come in, I try to be kind and, and greet them, and, and, but I'm only one person, and I can be rather off-putting to some people. I know that. So I just want to encourage you. You realize that together we are the body of Jesus. Like, I, I may be the nose, and, and you may be the eye, and, and, and some of you may be the forehead, and, and others may be a foot, and other, but together we make the body of Jesus. And when we're gracious, and when we're kind, and when we're loving, and we, we invite anyone and everyone into our midst. And when we welcome them, and when we see a, a person who doesn't look like us or think like us or act like us, when we greet them with love and warmth, that's demonstrating the love of Jesus. Now, 
Not every Christian is like this, and I pray that our church will be. I've recently, um, our, our HOA in which I live has been in, in disarray. And um, in fact, there's been, uh, for the last several years, the board has consisted of three people, two of which live out of state. Right. So um, we just said it's time to do something. Like we need an HOA here to, you know, we want property values to, to stay what they are. And we want like, you know, don't open up a garage and park cars in your in your you know, driveway, whatever, I don't know. Um, so we went through all this work, and, uh, you know, a good number of people participated in this process, and uh, we got all the group together, and uh, we determined collectively the body, there's about 80 people there, the body determined that the best time to meet would be Sunday nights. And... Um, we have a Facebook page. It's a closed Facebook page for HOA where it's in which the members of the community can participate and converse. And I've watched as a couple in particular um, Christians begin to almost get hostile about the fact that we're holding groups on we're holding our HOA meetings on Sunday night. And they said things like, "We go to church on Sunday night," and, and which is fine. But they begin to, to, to get hostile and complain and, and get angry. And I had the opportunity to meet one of those people. And um, as we were voting, the process for voting for a new HOA board became rather complicated. Had the opportunity to meet one of those people. And in conversation, I was listening to this individual talk to the person who was collecting the ballots. And um, she kept, she was mean. And kept talking about how, like, how inconvenient it was. And she was a Christian. She goes to church and, and kept blaming church and, and being a Christian for not being able to... Produce. And I finally just had to say to her, I'm like, look, you're throwing Jesus under the bus and you need to stop whining. And as I listened to that, and it was nice, but I did say that. And as I listened to that, all of a sudden I, I realized, like, I, I wonder how our community, how the, how the world sees Christians. Do they, do they see us as whiners or do they see us as lovers? Do they see us as, as like, it's, it's got to be my way or do they see us as gracious? Like, how does the world see us? I'll tell you how the world saw Jesus. The people that he encountered loved him. Loved him. And I would just say to us that I hope that's the characteristic that defines our church. An environment where anyone and everyone can walk in and feel the love and the grace of God. Now let me just say this. We will as a church, one of the hills, we define seven hills that we will die on, things that will never change. We will teach what God wants. And we will encourage people to stop living by the world's standards and let God's ways be their ways. We will do that. We cannot move away from what Scripture says. We must embrace this. Now, sometimes, we'll ch sometimes people will change their minds and will let Jesus be the leader of their lives, and sometimes they won't. But as a church, we must fully commit to always acting in love towards all people. And our harshest criticisms must be reserved for graceless and judgmental people who seek to add unnecessary burdens to other people's lives through unbiblical expectations of both believers and unbelievers. And that's what the book of Galatians is all about. The church, we will say what God says. We will seek to live and love like God lives and loves. And in all things, we will seek to become a place of hope in a world that is rapidly losing hope. And so I would just say to, to you, just, just as I'm processing all this stuff, I would just say to you today, if, I could hear, if you could hear anything out of everything that I've said today, it would be this. Stop being surprised when a crazy world acts crazy. Start looking to Jesus. He's the one that can actually rescue us from all the craziness. And then finally, I would say, move out into the world just like our leader has done, with love and kindness in the hopes of connecting people to God. And so I wanted to just challenge you. The band's going to come. We're going to wrap up this morning with just the anthem. I love the name of that song, the anthem. It talks about the victory that Christ has won. He is the one who will rescue us. But this week, I would just challenge you with a couple of steps. Who can you take out to coffee this week?
or lunch or breakfast or invite over to your backyard or go to their backyard that does not believe like you. See, as Christians, it's very, very easy to quickly eliminate everybody who doesn't believe like us and to be surrounded only by people who look like us and think like us and act like us and talk like us. Would you this week take the effort to go out with someone and to be with someone who doesn't believe like you do? And then secondly, I would just say to you, how can you show kindness to someone of a different race or someone of a different sexual identity than you this week? You know, the world is watching closely, the church. The world is watching us closely. And these coming days and weeks, we're going to actually prove or disprove what they believe to be true about the church. And my prayer is that as a group, we will disprove what they believe to be true about the church and instead will be a place where hope is found, where love is felt, where lives are changed. Because ultimately, this is what our leader Jesus came into this world to do, to rescue us from the craziness of the world, to teach us new things, and to set us free to live a big, beautiful life. Now, Father, so much craziness. But really, as we look, Lord, at the Scriptures, they, they just say something pretty clear. It says that uh, you've come into this world. John chapter 3 says you came into this world not to judge the world, but to save the world. May we do the same thing. May we move out, Lord, into this week. May we offer smiles. May we offer gestures of kindness. I pray, Lord, that the things we post on Facebook would be thoughtful and reflective of what Christ would post. I pray, Lord, that as we meet uh, men and women of different race, men and women of different um, economic background, men and women of different sexual preferences, men and women, Lord, who uh, may have different religious backgrounds, I pray that we would represent Christ well, that our love would be the thing that sets us apart. Not our whining, not our complaining, not our belligerence, but that our love, the love that God has for the world, the kind of love that took Jesus to the cross to die for our sins. I pray that that's the distinctive that would mark our church, our lives, but not just us, Lord, that would mark everyone who calls himself a Christian. Because at the end of the day, Lord, we know that that is your mission, is to rescue us from the world, to teach us how to live, to teach us a new way to think, and to send us back into the world to love on and to rescue others to bring them to God. This is our prayer and our hope. In the name of Christ, the one who wins every time, we pray these things. Amen.